The Swakopmund Museum is a cultural mammoth where history has come to live forever. In this documentary, we will take you on a journey through time where you will discover the Namibian way of life and how it is being preserved. Welcome to the Swakopmund Museum. Here you will find something of interest for everyone, be it the model cars, exhibition, the clothes worn over 100 years ago, the dinosaur fossils, the ox wagon, the interactive devil's claw exhibition, or being able to admire even secretive and endangered animals from up close. There are many gems in this museum, literally. And the best, you can go on this educational and fun-filled tour at an affordable price and it is right at your doorstep at the Swakopmund Mall, right below the lighthouse. The Swakopmund Museum was established in 1951 by Dr. Alphonse Weber. He was a dentist who came from Germany to, to Namibia in 1931 and he settled in the beautiful town of Swakopmund. He traveled the country with this interesting chair and um, had remote patients. So he helped the people that were sometimes unable to pay with money. So he, um, they gave him interesting objects instead. He was a fervent collector of all kinds of things. So he got, um, for example, colonial objects and also from the indigenous population. And he got a deep understanding of the country and the people while visiting the patients in remote parts. Through the way this museum was established by Dr. Alfons Weber collecting different objects, the museum does not tell one coherent story, but has fragments of everything. There's history and transport and technology, botany, zoology. Um, geology, we've got quite an interesting collection of beautiful stones as well. So the museum has quite a lot of gems, literally. The first humans are believed to originate from southern Africa and the earliest signs were found in Namibia. Of course, there are no real skulls or human remains in the Swakopmund Museum, but they are replicas of two important humanoid fossils that were found in Namibia. The oldest sign of our ancestors found is the jawbone of the Otavipithecus namibiensis. It is around 13 million years old. This creature is not yet to be called a human, but was something on the evolutionary side between an ape and a human being, a so-called humanoid. The replica of this scientifically significant find can be closely looked at in the Swakopmund Museum. There is further a replica that means not a real piece of bones of the so-called Ochiseva man who is believed to have lived some 80 to 100,000 years ago. Other signs left by early humans in Namibia are Stone Age tools and weapons, rock engravings and rock paintings. These are 1000s of years old and some can be admired in the Swakopmund Museum. Currently, the Sun are believed to be the first people that lived in Namibia, followed by the Damara. Next came the Kwe, who settled in southern Namibia. Ovambo and Kavango, belonging to the Bantu nation, are believed to have come into northern Namibia around the 15th to the 16th century. Also, the Herero tribes moved to Namibia around that time. They entered the current country from the northwest. In the 19th century, white South African farmers moved north, pushing the indigenous Khoisan people called Warlams across the Orange River into Namibia, causing conflict with local tribes. Also, the Bastards, a descendants of Boer men and African women, mostly Nama, were forced northward by the expansion of the white settlers. The Bastards settled in central Namibia and founded the Free Republic of Riobort in 1872. The first European to set foot on Namibian soil is believed to be Diogo Cao in 1486. The erection of a so-called Padrao, a limestone cross at Cape Cross, is shown in a diorama in the Swakopmund Museum. The Swakopmund Museum also has a replica of this cross. The original cross was taken by a German Navy commander in 1893 
and shipped to Berlin. Now the Cape Cross has been returned to Namibia and is waiting for its final resting place. Shortly after Diogokao, Bartholomew's deer set out to sail around the tip of Africa and erected several crosses among others at Luderitz. Neither of these Portuguese explorers went through the desert to the interior of the land. Only some explorers, hunters and traders as well as missionaries ventured into Namibia about 200 years ago. But most early Europeans were not interested in inland Namibia, only in her marine resources around Wolfish Bay and the southern islands. Wolfish Bay was first visited by Europeans in 1487 by Bartholomew Diaz, who noted the plentiful whales in the area. During the following centuries, whalers from countries such as America, Britain, France, and Portugal hunted whales off the Namibian coast until local extinction. Wolfish Bay claimed by the Dutch in 1793 supplied the seafarers with fresh water and supplies. The English annexed the area in 1840. Wolfish Bay only became Namibian territory four years after independence. Seals and guano were also harvested on the Namibian coast. Testament to these activities is the cauldron in the Sokobun Museum, which was used to render oil from the seal carcasses. The section about whaling and whales in the Sokobun Museum is quite informative. Interest in Namibia's interland arose when in 1883, the German trader Adolf Luderitz bought what was then called Angra Bequena, later called Luderitz, from the Nama chief Joseph Fredericks II. A diorama in the Sokobun Museum depicts the hoisting of the German flag. In 1884, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck declared German Southwest Africa is a German colony. The Germans had to find a port to enter the hinterland of their new colony. Since Wolfish Bay was under British rule, the Germans had to find another harbor in central Namibia. Captain Kurt von Francois founded Sokopmund on the 4th August 1892. Since there was no fresh water supply around, no permanent settlements of indigenous tribes existed here before. Soon, Sokopmund was the hub of the German colony where goods, settlers and the Schutztruppe arrived and were transported to the interior of the colony. Facets of different transport systems are shown in the Sokopmund Museum. After the cattle plague decimated the oxen needed for the ox wagon transport, the construction of the railway system started in Swakopmund in 1897. In the early times of the colony, ships landed at the mall. Everything was moved from the imperial customs shed, which constitutes the foundation of the museum building. Um, this is where the old entrance of the building had been. This had been a shed. Um, house or sh the shed for customs in the old German days with railway connection to the mole because the ships, the bigger ships, couldn't land. They had to throw anchors out in the deep sea and smaller boats came in and the mole was built for the boats to offload goods there and uh, a railway line was constructed and connected here with this building um, where the goods were looked at for uh, paying customs and so on. So this was actually quite a big building. It was built in the early 1890s, quite after the um, Swakopmund was, the settlement was started. And this actually much older days, this is also the borderline where old Gondwana uh, divided into South America, drifted away from Africa. So this is actually on the line where that happened. So that's a very old story, but maybe it's also quite interesting. So the railway line went into and it was um, also for, not for incoming goods, it was also for outgoing um, objects like um, minerals and um, whatever was sent 
uh, out to Europe, it was also that it had to go through here. So it was quite a busy place during the early 1900s when the First World War started. So it was one of the first buildings that was targeted and uh, shot by the South African English Army and um, it burned out completely. Only the walls were st still standing after the war. And it stood empty for almost 50 years until Dr. Weber, who started the museum, decided, oh, this would be a perfect place to start a museum in this locality here. It is important to understand where we are coming from and to value our heritage. To foster mutual understanding, we need to understand the customs and traditions of our fellow Namibians. Towards this aim, the Swakamund Museum has dedicated a whole hall to the different groups of Namibians. And while it is shown here the distinct, distinct um, traditions and the modern way of living of um, the ethnic groups, these hard boundaries do not exist in Namibia anymore, especially after independence. There's a mix of cultures and people, and there's a multicultural society evolving and changing all the time. So, um, but it's still important that we, that we understand our roots, that we know where we're coming from, that we understand the values of, our, of other groups in Namibia. And, um, so we, we invite people also to give comments and to give input to, um, to this special exhibition dedicated to the people of Namibia in the Swakopmund Museum. The Swakopmund Museum not only has parts of our Namibian history, it also has a lot of information about plants and animals and interesting minerals of Namibia and many other topics. Museums in general and the Swakopmund Museum in particular, are very valuable places for education and for fostering scientific understanding. Here you can admire nature and be motivated to, to conserve our beautiful Namibian wildlife. Museums give a um, preserve heritage. They promote cultural awareness if done sensitively. And they help to build national pride. And the Swakopmund Museum wants to be a community museum, so we invite students and individuals to present objects here. We've got a place for um, temporary exhibitions where we could, for example, show science fair projects or anything else that would be of interest to the larger public. We also have um, films and we have show lectures in the state-of-the-art lecture hall to, to raise scientific understanding and to have uh, motivate people of how interesting it is to learn for lifelong learning. This is quite an old ox wagon, and the ox wagons were used traditionally in uh, Namibia even before Europeans came because Jan Jonker Afrikaner must have come with ox wagons from South Africa over the Orange River borders, and um, then later missionaries brought ox wagons, and the um, Hendler, the traders. The, traders came with ox wagons and went all over the country. But this ox wagon, um, when the museum was built and started, um, Dr. Weber put the advert in the newspaper and said he's looking after, old, or after an ox wagon that he wants for the museum. And some people up in the north read that and said, oh, we still have got an ox wagon. Maybe we can sell that one. And um, the story then was that the Dorsland trekkers, well, everybody understand, the Afrikaans, South Africans that went into Angola and lived there for quite a few years in the early 1900s, 
they uh, also came with ox wagons, but there was one family that didn't have an ox wagon, but the family provided millies to a mission missionary station in Angola. And as payment, they got this ox wagon. Then, and when the, those people came, were taken back to Namibia in the 1930s, the family came with this ox wagon over the Konene into uh, Namibia and then Fruitfontein area where they got a farm. And um, first they didn't have a house on the farm so they still lived on the ox wagon. The whole family slept in underneath the tent and they lived here from the ox wagon and uh, until the uh, house was built and uh, trees, um, wood was transported by the ox wagon to build the uh, house and, and fences. Then the ox wagons got quite old and it was just used to uh, keep skins on it that the jackals and the dogs wouldn't eat the skins. So it stood under the tree and rain fall over it and it got quite old. And um, when the advert was read by the people, they said, oh, our ox wagon, maybe we must replace some of the pieces of wood, like one can see here, there's a new beam put in and the wheels were also repaired a little bit, but they sold the ox wagon for something like a few pounds. Uh, it was sold, to, changed ownership for the sum of 50 dollar uh, rand in those days. And as there were no um, oxen in those days, to pull the ox cart to the railway station from uh, of Fruitfontein from where it was transported down here to Swakopmund, they used donkeys. So the uh, the thistle worm, I think that's a thistle worm, was shortened that donkeys could pull it. That's why the reason, because a normal ox wagon should have a much longer one for oxen to be spanned in like one would be able to see on photos. Um, and now the ox, this ox wagon is standing already for more than 50 years here. In and traveling in the dark with a candle, but with mirrors it was, the light was enlarged a little bit. The break. Okay. Oh, okay. The driver had to operate it. And at the same time, tell the horses to Which way to go. <laughs> yeah. Here we are in the zoological corner and we've got quite an interesting collection all collected by one person. Uh, insects, different insects, beetles, butterflies and moths and more and then another collection of birds eggs um, of most species of Namibia, the eggs that were laid by one nesting group and it's not so very easy just to collect birds' eggs. You have to wait until the whole clutch is laid. Uh, some birds lay 10 eggs in one nest and other birds just lay one egg. So you have to know that beforehand. And um, to keep the eggs then not to break and not that they are half incubated is quite an art. So this one man who was a farmer and a prospector, um, did all this without any training. He was not a, uh, going to any university, but just self-educated. Um, so it's quite an amazing job that he did because there are more and more boxes of these insects. There are many hundreds of them. and also of the bird's eggs. It was when he died, the sons <coughs> offered this collection to the museum and we took advantage of that also for teaching children of what one can do privately by one's own. Yes. This butterfly, if you look at it from that side, it just looks black and white. If you look at it from this side, you see it looks quite different with the 
purple and the same in nature when the sun is on the butterfly it's like that this top butterfly the uh, orangey black one is poisonous and so the female of that one also tries to look very much the same it's up here they the females just imitate the male monarch to look to birds poisonous. So the, the monarch African butterfly monarch is there. Is a poisonous one. And some birds' eggs are very round, not to roll out of the nest, but other others have then points again, like these. They um, come more out of a not so closed nest that they have to stay inside. Also the guinea fowl's eggs are pointed like chicken eggs. The Swakopmund Museum is also home to other historical memorabilia, priceless artifacts and articles containing the history of the beginning of the town as well as the evolution of Namibia from being a once upon a time a German colony. The museum houses replicas of collections that tell how life was lived in Namibia even before the First World War. Within its walls, it keeps a collection of car models, replicas from around the world, and it tells a story of the evolution of other artifacts such as the typewriter, the print media, and the telephone, and even the pocket watch. Furthermore, the museum walls are home to pictures and articles that tell a story of the evacuation of Swakopmund during the First World War in 1914 when the inhabitants were evacuated to inland Namibia. The Swakopmund Museum is also home to the replica of the popular Martin Luther steam tractor which dates back to the 1800s. The collections in the museum also includes two bells of which one was found in the Namib desert during the 1970s. There's another interesting, more interesting bell here on the other side. Mm. Good morning. This old bell up here. This old bell was found in the desert in the 1970s mm -hmm. and nobody knew its history until we looked up in dairies and found out that it actually, or here on the bell, it's written the date of 1736 um, and the name of somebody, Kelbert Josef Fuchs, has... Um, made this bell in uh, Köln, in C Cologne. In the museum, the olden way of life in Namibia is also visible through the transformation of the tools that have been used to hunt, the types of bottles that have been shipped into Namibia by explorers, and even by the advancement of the way things such as jewelry and forms of transportation have changed. And it is here where Namibia will be able to always tell its story.